Welcome to MuggleCast, your weekly ride into the Wizarding World fandom. I'm Neville. <laughs> I didn't know we were doing that. I'm Seamus. I'm Stan. And I'm Luna. <laughs> this week, we're lying our way onto magical transportation and analyzing Prisoner of Azkaban, Chapter 3, The Night Bus. This episode is brought to you by support from muggles like you who pledge to our Patreon. Check out our latest bonus muggle cast available exclusively on Patreon in which we discuss a new official Harry Potter encyclopedia air quotes coming this fall. Is it the encyclopedia we've been hoping for? What can we expect from it? Remember when the author confirmed an encyclopedia was in the works over 10 years ago? And is it the one she promised? We discuss all of that in the latest bonus MuggleCast installment, and in fact, two bonus MuggleCasts and many more benefits like ad-free MuggleCast, the chance to co-host the show, monthly Zoom hangouts with us, and a lot more await you on our Patreon. And Apple Podcast subscribers can also support the show right through their app to receive ad-free MC. Thank you, Muggles, who support us. We really, really appreciate it. And without further ado, it's time for Chapter 3 of the Night Bus and our seven-word summary. Now, actually, before we do this, we should say, Micah, you had the idea right before the show, we should ask the very popular chat GPT for a seven-word summary. Yep. And it did do it. And it gave you seven words, not five. Right. Google Bard, their response to chat GPT, gave me a five-word summary. I was very disappointed. <laughs> oh, my God. Should I read chat GPTs first, or should we do it no, ourselves first? No, I think first? we should do ours first. We don't want any outside influence here yeah. yeah that's true that's true and then yeah. we can be embarrassed that chat gpts is better than what we come up with <laughs> <laughs> and i thought i would continue the trend that has been going on for prisoner of azkaban seven word summary which is the person who came up with the discussion is going to go first so here we go help arrives for Harry. After. Anne. Oh. Observation. Okay. I was. I was. Oh no! I no! No! no. I'm redoing it. A... I'm redoing it. Encounter. Encounter. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I was leaning towards like attack or right, uh, incident. Right. Incident. That would have been good. My brain just stopped working there. I'll say yeah. Encounter. Well, ChatGPT. Now, keep in mind, ChatGPT didn't have four people taking turns. It was just one AI created the following. Harry hails the night bus to Hogwarts, which actually, I guess, isn't accurate because he doesn't it's go not. to Hogwarts. And yeah. and we've we've often shied away from not using the chapter's title in the seven word summary. And yeah. Harry uh, to start. That's another rule that we have. We yeah, never it, it broke that. all the rules. Yeah. I guess it didn't know the rules. True. Google's barred was a little more accurate, but it was only five words. The night bus rescues Harry. But we can't count that because it's five words. So they they both broke rules in <laughs> one way or another. They're bad. They're such bad butts. Thank goodness. We're keeping away, keeping ahead of the AI. Thank yes, goodness. We still have our jobs. <laughs> All right. Well, let's jump into the discussion of chapter three, the night bus. Take it away, my. Uh, <laughs> so the first discussion... I labeled seriously, uh, and of course, we'll, we'll talk more about Sirius, but the chapter opens and Harry is really caught between two worlds. He's run away from Privet Drive, but the problem for him is there's nowhere for him to go. He can't go back to the Dursleys. He doesn't want to be outside too long and be seen by muggles. Ron and Hermione are traveling abroad. And he's terrified of having been expelled from Hogwarts. Again, this is a recurring trend for Harry. And uh, have we ever been in, in a similar kind of situation in that we made a knee-jerk decision and then we're then in the aftermath of that, but we have absolutely no idea what we're going to do? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This has happened to me too. And And when you get in those... Those moments where you're, th you're not necessarily thinking about the next step, only the present step. Um, and when you're in as much pain as Harry is, too, like you just, it hurts to hurt. <laughs> it's just like, oh, the whole world just crumbling in. It's, it's not a good feeling. Yeah. Of course, I didn't mean, have we ever been in a similar situation where we blew up our aunt and 
we're running away from our. <laughs> I've also done that actually. Family, you have. Okay, I was just. Uh, yeah, oh. yeah. She's fine now, by the way. Though I'm glad to hear that. Well, maybe, maybe you've been in a fight with a family member, and you're like, "Oh, I really wish I didn't say that." Like, I definitely had a couple tense fights with my parents, especially when I was in like my teenage rebellion years. And I may have said something that I quickly regretted. And I can think back to a moment. I think my parents, one of them may have quickly regretted, too, because it was just kind of uncalled for, though it feels like it's called for in the moment. So, yeah, I think, um, yeah, these types of things happen. I've never been like the feeling of being deserted before. I've had some long nights, maybe, or I maybe had a little too much to drink and maybe I was lost. <laughs> <laughs> like wandering the streets of Vegas lost? Um, let's say London trying to get into a hotel room probably was at the wrong room, fell asleep in front of the door. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> was it your hotel room? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this has gone way off course. <laughs> but yeah, Harry is basically in this internal struggle, right? He's being pulled between these two different worlds. One who he's grown up in, the other whom you know, he very much loves. And again, you know, Andrew, I see you have here that whole adding another point about being afraid of being expelled from Hogwarts because he's done magic for the second straight summer at Privet Drive. Well, at least he was blamed for what happened last summer. And so he thinks that just like what happened in the beginning of Chamber of Secrets, now he's going to be very much in trouble because he's actually done a lot worse than what Dobby did if we're uh, if we're keeping score here. You know, Harry lives in a world where everything makes sense, where the rules are consistent from year to year. I can't say I blame him for wor worrying about this. Yeah, but it is funny over the course of these books so far, there have been numerous times where Harry's like, my life is over. I'm going to be expelled. And I have jokingly said we do need an expel count because I think I'm going to be expelled count because it does seem like it comes up quite a bit. And I'm pleased to share today that I finally did tally the number of times that Harry or his friends thought they were going to be expelled. Do you want me to run through the whole list or I can just give you the number? <laughs> I'm interested in the list, but tell me because this will break my heart. Uh, is it higher than our current Dumbledore lie count of eight? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, man. But only by two. It's ten. Ten, including today. Here in this chapter, Harry thought he would be expelled. He, Harry or his friends. There was a time where Hermione thought, you know, that classic line, we could have all been killed or worse, expelled. Yeah, I think there's also that time where Harry is first going to Hogwarts and he feels like, what if I don't have magic? And they tell me, oh, sorry, we made a mistake. That's like not expelled, but it's like you wouldn't be good enough to continue kind of a thing. And I didn't include that one because I tallied them up by opening up the Kindle books and searching for Expel. <laughs> yes, hey, Expel, yeah. But 10, it's higher than our Dumbledore lie count. What, what is but that? But I think, well, I think the rate will probably slow down as Harry gets older. And, and I'm sure you three are all gleeful to hear that even I think that the Dumbledore lie count will accelerate as we get later into these yeah. books. Fully agree. Both Harry and Dumbledore get m more bold in these regards as the series goes on. Harry's like, oh, they're not going to expel me. I've done so much. I'm Harry Potter. Yep. <laughs> Nobody can expel me. <laughs> you can't get rid of me now. Look at all I've done. But with Sirius Black being on the loose and having broken out of Azkaban, I was thinking that perhaps the ministry's first thought would have been to place protection in and around Privet Drive. And this kind of really contrasts in a way what we see in the opening of Order of the Phoenix when there are actually Dementors present uh, in Little Whinging. So why isn't the ministry better prepared here if Harry is in fact a target and we see how nervous Fudge is about Harry being a target? There's no protection that we're made aware of on Privet Drive. Seems like a mistake on their part. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. Could Dumbledore have told the Ministry about Fig, though, keeping an eye on Privet Drive? I've already got a discreet monitor in place. You probably don't need another one. Maybe. But she, what's she going to do? <laughs> oh, well, then she could alert the Ministry or Dumbledore. That's the kind of interesting thing about... So Fug... Uh, Fug? 
Fig. Sorry, <laughs> we're dealing with fig and fudge. So again, it's I, I get I get it's it. early. Fig is uh, very much Dumbledore's operative. And so I don't think he'd be like to the ministry. Like he only brings Fig out uh, to the attention of the ministry when it's to save Harry from getting expelled <laughs> in year five by talking about the Dementor. And we know how that goes. But I, I get the feeling that uh, he prefers having spies and things for Harry that the ministry isn't aware of and doing his own kind of surveillance. I wonder, though, because the two things happen. So the ministry does not, that we know, put anybody on Wisteria Walk or Magnolia Crescent or Privet Drive. But Sirius or a big black thing does find Harry and find where he lives, having despite having never been there before. So something a little bit is uneven here where it's like, OK, so if if Harry Potter is a, a very um, known target, nobody should be able to beat the ministry or the government there and protecting him. He's like, instead of um, being public enemy, number one, he's like public protect this guy, number one. It feels like it just demonstrates the uh, inadequacy and the incompetence of the ministry and Fudge in particular. It does make me wonder about the timeline for Sirius's breakout, though. Do we ever get this? No. Because I'm wondering how recently it happened before the start of this book, right? Yeah. I mean, you think there would be a little bit of time in between when he actually breaks out and when it shows up on the Muggle News, because it's not like, well, we do see him on the front page of the Daily Prophet when Harry gets onto the night bus. But mm-hmm. again, to your point, like how long had it been since he broke out? You know, How much time did he have to be able to get to Privet Drive? How did he even get that information, to your point, Eric, to know where to go to find Harry? We don't really get insight there as well, but I ju- it just feels like a, a really big miss on the part of the ministry to not have dispatched somebody there to protect Harry, knowing that he would likely be target number one, because we see how the ministry acts throughout this entire book. They put Dementors at Hogwarts. There's Dementors that follow the Hogwarts Express, right? So- I got to point out, Stray Neasel is uh, giving us what we're asking for here. Sirius breaks out after he sees the Weasley's portrait in the Daily Prophet because he sees Peter on Ron's shoulder. That's what it is. Thank you, Stray Neasel. And it's also funny he even gets the Daily Prophet as a prisoner. Like, I'm glad, but... Yeah. I think we get more information on that, don't we? About how he came across that particular story. He asks Fudge for it. He says he uh, loves doing the crosswords. <laughs> <laughs> Fudge is like, sure, here's the, here's the paper, criminal. Well, the <laughs> funny thing ya. is, I actually love that Fudge has a lot of weaknesses. But when we get to that story, I really like it because Fudge trusts in the system to have like kept Sirius Black subdued. Like he's... Fudge is off put by how normal Sirius Black is, but he's still like, well, you've been in here 13 years. I guess it's safe uh, and hands it to him. <laughs> like just kind of a weird day. I don't know. It's interesting. Well, Harry does come across a big black dog while he is uh, trying to figure out what to do. And one of the things that uh, I wanted to bring up, and we did this when uh, we were doing our Chamber of Secrets chapter by chapter, is to compare scenes here. So. There's something uh, that is really telling about the eyes, the eyes that he sees. And as it relates to Sirius, it says that Harry saw quite distinctly the hulking outline of something very big with wide gleaming eyes. And then if you go back to Chamber of Secrets, it says Harry sat bolt upright on the garden bench. He had been staring absentmindedly into the hedge and the hedge was staring back. Two enormous green eyes had appeared among the leaves. So what I like about this is both times we're getting introduced to fairly important characters in the series through the same kind of type of description very early on in the book. Nice Yeah, that is great. And I bet it won't be the last time it happens either. I'm sure (laughs) we're going to- Yeah, (laughs) there will be other examples as we- Move forward, I'm sure. What do we make of, is it kind of where Harry's perspective is that he's just fallen over, that the uh, figure is so big? Or just how big is Sirius's Animagus form? I mean, we know it like carries Ron or drags Ron into the 
passageway before, but I've always thought that it was more dog sized normally. Or is it kind of like because it's an endomagus, it's bigger than a normal version of the animal? I'm I'm kind of confused as to what breed it would be. Yeah, I don't know. I guess when you're so surprised and it's nighttime and you're seeing the eyes through the bushes, your sense of perception might be off. Your perspective mm-hmm. might be a little off in terms of the size. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Right. Yeah. He's definitely in a bit of a panic mode here. So I, I think anything really would have startled him, even if it was like a, a tiny rat or mouse that was like going through the uh the trash can there i don't know if it would have knocked him over the way that sirius does but uh yeah i just think harry is not in in a great state of mind here where he'd be like oh cute doggy let me pet yeah (laughs) yeah speaking of that i have a a little bit of a, a fandom throwback moment here i wanted to see if anyone remembers this so Y'all remember the official like WB Harry Potter site, harrypotter.com. It had forums. Um, I don't know if any of y'all were ever active on those. I definitely was. This was like the pre muggle net days for me before I had <laughs> all of y'all, my Harry Potter friends online. So I would just chat with other people on these forums. And ahead of the release of the Prisoner of Azkaban movie, there was a whole campaign launched on these forums encouraging people to report their sightings of the Grimm. And it was really cool because people got really creative and were writing their own like police reports and almost like fan fiction um, type stories about encountering Sirius's animagus form. I thought it was a cool way to get people engaged, you know? Yeah. Well done, publicists at the time. I know. (laughs) Definitely before my fun memory. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I I vaguely remember Harry Potter dot com in the early days. I don't remember the forums. I don't think I ever went to them. I'm trying to load it up on the Wayback Machine right now, but it's uh giving me errors, unfortunately. So I wanted to throw out a what if. Clearly Sirius startles Harry, and as luck should have it, as he falls over, he hails the night bus. And I'm just curious. Let's say the night bus never shows up. Harry falls into the street. Maybe he scrapes his knee a little bit. Do we think Sirius would have revealed himself to Harry in that moment? And let's say that he does. What are the chances he would have believed Sirius's story? Because it's kind of like, at this point, Harry doesn't know much about his past and and obviously Lupin plays a major role in that in this book in in kind of giving Harry information on on his father and their friendship but it would seem like a really crackpot story like who is this bum that's showing up <laughs> you know in between uh what is it Wisteria Walk and Magnolia Crescent and yeah uh you know pitching me a story about how uh, <laughs> him and my father were friends at school and and it's like well, wait a second. I got tricked by Quirrell, tricked by Riddle, tricked by Lockhart. <laughs> I'm not falling for this again. No, what he's going to say is, were you either a Ravenclaw or a Slytherin? <laughs> He'd be like, I was a Gryffindor. <laughs> okay, come on. Yeah, uncle. Uh, I guess I'll trust <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah. I haven't been d- bamboozled by a Gryffindor yet. The only thing more terrifying than a giant black dog is a giant black dog that then transforms into this shabby man who hasn't showered in a dozen years. Yeah, I don't think Harry would trust him. No, because imagine the info dump that would have to happen. Hey, I was friends with your parents at Hogwarts. People think that I am responsible for their death. I'm not. Actually, your friend Ron's rat is the one that's responsible for it. He faked his death. I broke out of Azkaban. Let's go kill him. (laughs) <laughs> like, there's no version of events that Sirius could give Harry at this point of time yep. that wouldn't make Harry think this is an adult person and I am in danger. I have to get away. <laughs> right. But where is he? Go- where would he run to? That's the even better question, because he's not going back to the Dursleys. Right. Is it, is, does it turn into one of those horror movies where, like, you're just running down the street trying to find the nearest neighbor who's actually home? He runs to Mrs. Fig. Mrs. Fig. 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 Or Fig follows him and Fig sends a note to Dumbledore. And Yeah, though somebody pointed out uh, in the Discord that Mrs. Fig in book five says she doesn't even have an owl, which is totally nuts. She's got cats. She's got a bat phone to page Dumbledore. (laughs) That's awesome. 
I'm totally imagining that now. Um, I mean, Harry really considers life on the run, what it would be like. He needs gold. He thinks about going to London. He thinks about um, bewitching his trunk to be feather light, something I didn't know he knew how to do, uh, and taking his broom to London. I mean, he he would have he would have gotten somewhere eventually, um, but certainly not expecting that when you you know accidentally throw your arm out while falling that it hails safety. Well, safety in quotation marks, because Perfy. the night bus is not exactly, <laughs> you know, a stretch limo. This is one of the few things that I think is perfectly adapted from this book to the movie, the night bus. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily anything in it, not necessarily characters, but the night bus. It's real good. Yeah, it, it's great. And I pulled some background information here on the night bus from wizardingworld.com, and it said... The night bus is a relatively modern invention in wizarding society, which sometimes, though it will rarely admit it, takes ideas from the muggle world. The need for some form of transportation that could be used safely and discreetly by the underage or the infirm had been felt for a while, and many suggestions had been made. Sidecars on taxi-style broomsticks, carrying baskets under thestrals, uh, all of them which ended up being vetoed by the ministry, and finally, the Minister for Magic, Dougal McPhail, hit upon the idea of imitating the Muggles' relatively new bus service. And in 1865, the night bus hit the streets. Hit the streets. Hit the streets. Hit the pavement. Pedal to the metal. <laughs> now, there was another little interesting bit of information there that I didn't include, but pure blood wizards in particular didn't really like this form of transportation because it was borrowed from the Muggle world. Though it was noted that obviously over time they warmed up to it and did in fact end up using it uh, on occasion, but just you know another example of okay pure blood wizards like Lucius Malfoy not uh, being too keen on this. I thought you were going to say they didn't like it because it goes through Muggle communities, mm. and we don't need to be hanging around those Muggles. That's kind of how we all, we all feel about the bus, right? <laughs> None of us are like, yeah, bus. We're all like, we have to go on the bus. Oh, with all the other people. <laughs> Buses generally aren't great. I've always been... Um, but what about triple deckers? Well, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, triple deckers are super cool. Obviously, for anybody, maybe kids don't know, like England, London has the iconic double decker bus. That's one of the fascinating things you get to see when you visit London. And then this one's triple decker, baby. That's really cool. Plus, I love the purple color. I love the name of it. It's probably one of my favorite modes of transportation in the wizarding world. It's like getting a triple decker Oreo. It's just you can't ask for more. Double stuffed, triple stuffed. And it's like Harry's knight in shining armor. It comes to whisk him away yeah. um, to safety. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, Eric, because we do have a name origin here. I feel refreshed. I just woke up a little bit. <laughs> so the night bus was named because firstly, night is a homonym of night, and there are night buses running all over Britain after normal transport stops. Secondly, as you pointed out, Eric, night has the connotation of coming to the rescue, of protection. And this seemed appropriate for a vehicle that is often the conveyance of last resort. The driver and conductor of the night bus in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban are named after J.K. Rowling's two grandfathers, Ernest and Stanley. So while we had the portrayal of her grandmother in Aunt Marge in the last chapter, we have her two grandfathers showing up here in Prisoner of Azkaban, Chapter Three. I like this as a thing, you know, when you're when you're three books down and you're like, okay, I'm going to start putting like some personal stuff, like you know, names <laughs> and tri- tributes. No, really, like if it was not a matter of if, but when uh, you'll throw in a name, mm-hmm. and it's like a perfectly fine name. Speaking of details around the night bus. There is a passing line. Harry asks if muggles can see or hear the night bus, and Stan implies they could if they listened or were better at noticing things. Right. So what's he mean by that? They can't see the night bus, surely. Does he mean, like, you know, if it runs over a little rock on the street, the rock would move? And if they thought about it, maybe... But then the muggle wouldn't believe... Oh, there's an invisible bus there. What do we think he means by this? I think... 
it's a perfect deflection from the actual question, <laughs> which is it, like it doesn't <laughs> he he could explain because he's a wizard. He could explain, oh, there's an undetectable charm on it or something. And instead, he's just like, no, nah, the muggles are just dumb. <laughs> they just don't notice, do they? Um, I think it is kind of like there are traces of magic. You would be able like if you listened, you would hear commotion. You would hear maybe metal rattling by just like maybe if you lived it, if you lived at Grimald Place. Uh, or on either side of the connected buildings, you may occasionally hear a clatter that wasn't from the neighbor two doors down. You know, they're like, I just think it would like bleed into the regular world by like sounds or feelings, maybe smells. But visually and kind of consciously, you could not look up and see the night bus coming to you if you're a muggle. I feel like, Laura, this is a conversation you and Mark would have. <laughs> is that uh, fair to say oh yeah we've definitely had the conversation uh you know obviously we both love harry potter but there are things like this that come up pretty frequently in these stories that don't exactly make sense and it's always fun to chat about what could we change or what could we make different to make it make sense i feel like the implication when it comes to muggles not noticing things comes up multiple times in this series, um, like even with a muggle trying to approach Hogwarts, for example, which, you know, according to Fantastic Beasts is sometimes possible, um, you know, they would see a sign saying it's ruins and do not enter, and they would just naturally want to walk away from it. There's this implication that muggles sort of unconsciously don't want to notice the strange or the unusual Maybe the implication is they're uncomfortable with things that they can't explain, so they naturally gravitate away from them. Mm. But again, that that is a very uh, broad brush yeah. to paint with, right? Because we know that not all muggles uh, are lacking in that kind of curiosity. We definitely see other examples of muggles in the wizarding world who aren't like this. Mm -hmm. An interesting question, though, would be, could a muggle get hit by the night bus? Because uh, I'm thinking about P Prisoner of Azkaban, and this is obviously a movieism, but they stop short, right, when the older woman is lady, crossing the street, and they have yeah. to wait for her to go, as opposed to just going through her, which I guess they can't do, presumably. Yeah, I would think so. I would think it would hit. A muggle or like getting back to my original question, like if it runs over a pebble, a muggle's going to hear that and see that, but not really think anything of it. I think it is physically there. It's just invisible, moving quietly. Yeah. And with uh, the way Ernie drives, uh, I think it's a matter <laughs> of when, not if. Take it away. I'm just I'm happy Ernie got more lines uh, in the <laughs> chapter here than he does in the movie. But yeah. <laughs> the, the night bus does seem like a mode of transportation that would be common knowledge in the wizarding community. So my question was, why doesn't Harry know about it? Is he just too young? Does he not have enough wizarding world experience? Is it one of those situations where because of everything that's going on, Harry doesn't even think of it in the moment? It might be more of like a suburb thing. Like, because it, like, unless you or a family member has taken the night bus to get somewhere, you won't have heard of it. Cause like, I'm trying to think of the first time I was on public trip, like a bus, um, having grown up in the suburbs, like I did not often, you know, and it's like, it's not clear that that service is offered until you see someone or know someone who does take it. Like the bus that drops people off at Walmart, um, every like hour on the hour. Didn't know that was a thing until I saw people getting off it. So it could be that thing. It could also be that uh, every book, a new form of transportation is being introduced, like uh, flu powder in the last book. This is the night bus next year, the port key. So it could just be that that's being peppered in kind of like that. Yeah, it does seem like something that would come up in a class, some sort of Wizarding World 101 class. We've got the Hogwarts Express. We've got the night bus. We've got the flu network. Like you would think there would there would be a run through of muggle transport or not muggle transportation wizard transportation and it would be helpful for young students especially ones who are just being introduced to the wizarding world to hear about all the different methods of communication that they can take that are safe and legal right <laughs> 
because clearly Harry is in a situation here where he's desperate uh, to get away from Privet Drive. And if he knew about the night bus, maybe he wouldn't have had to take the flying Ford Anglia. Oh, true. I think that Stray Diesel in our Discord has solved it. Uh, he says, I honestly, I have to assume Hagrid lost a whole bunch of literature that Harry was supposed to get. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a lot it of just sense. Scattered over Bristol. And he's carrying, it's like, here's the, the information about all your transport options. Well, speaking of Privet Drive, I did want to connect threads here between Prisoner of Azkaban and Order of the Phoenix. We know since we've just been talking about the night bus showing up to rescue Harry in this book, it's the advance guard who show up in Order of the Phoenix to take Harry away. And the situations, they're not all that similar, but they do have parallels that we can draw uh, in that uh, you know, here we have Sirius in Order of the Phoenix, we have Dementors involved, and we know that Dementors play a big role in this book. So uh, probably more to come on that. Uh, as we go through Prisoner of Azkaban. And they take the night bus in order of the Phoenix too, right? Yeah, they do. Yeah, you hear you hear about it more. It's always that uh that little thing. Oh yeah, that's available. It's kind of like being reminded that it exists every time you hear somebody took it. Well actually Hagrid takes it later on in this book when he goes to the ministry, him and Buckbeak, which I mean I would pay to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he had like a newt type suitcase or that magical bag you get in Hogwarts Legacy. Maybe. I just I just kind of see them chilling <laughs> on the top, like the wind <laughs> blowing through <laughs> Buckbeak's feathers. I was thinking that's what the third floor is for if you have any large beasts. But yes, in Order of the Phoenix, I think Hermione takes it to get to Grimmauld Place uh, prior to Christmas time. And then Harry and the Weasleys take it uh, to get to Hogwarts. So we do see it come up uh, again in Order of the Phoenix. But Eric, you have a burning question here. Yeah, um, it's it's so funny in this world building. Again, we don't know exactly how the night bus works, but it is stated it cannot under any circumstances go underwater. <laughs> so so why? Why can you build a bus that can't be detectable by muggles that can go uh, thousands of miles in the flip of a hand? Think about it. Harry throws his arm out, his wand arm. How does the magic know that it's his wand arm? I don't know, he throws it out, but within seconds of him doing that, wherever the bus was before, boom, it's there. Why can't it go underwater? Also, where would it go underwater? Who's living underwater in their little underwater home? Well, that's what I was going to say. Like, may, I, It doesn't need to go underwater, so that's why. But yeah, I agree. It, it should be able to operate like a submarine if it really needed to. Yeah, like, it feels like a buzzkill a little bit that it can't go underwater. <laughs> <laughs> That's another bus that we'll find out about someday. Okay. We have to come up with a name for it then. The sub bus. The bubble bus. Bubble, bubble bus. bus. I like that. Mm, okay, bubble bus. That works. Well, Harry gets on to the night bus with help from Stan Sean Pike. And we were joking about this at the top of the episode, but the net, the name that he gives to Stan, by the way, last week's Quizage question, is... Neville Longbottom. And there's probably a lot we can talk about here, given that Neville was, of course, the other option for Voldemort, and Harry gives his name while getting on the night bus. But what I found kind of funny about this whole thing is that the back and forth between Harry and Stan is very much how you would expect Neville to interact with Stan in terms of <laughs> <laughs> how Stan responds to him because it's, and again, we know Neville, what was the term we used many episodes ago? Glows up, glams up, does something. Oh, yeah. Glow glow up. Up. Yeah. yeah, He glows up, but right now he's one of those characters that he's a little bit of a doofus, right? And that's kind of how Stan treats him because he doesn't know anything about Sirius Black. Um, so I, I found that a little bit comical. I'm not sure what you guys thought. Well, a bit of a foreshadow alert, I think, I yeah. would say, especially because of the mm -hmm. Voldemort tie-in that mm -hmm. we get to later on. It is a cool point, though, because Harry learns about the prophecy in Order of the Phoenix. So this is a nice connecting the threads moment, because not only does Harry learn about the prophecy, to your point, Micah, he learns that the other option could have been Neville. 
So it's a nice indicator that these two are kind of intrinsically linked through fate. Of course. They just don't even know it. And why Neville of of everybody? Why is that the first person that comes to Harry's mind uh, to, to give that name over everybody else that he knows in the wizarding world? Who is worthless that nobody will recognize I know Neville. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm what? No, I'm really. I'm trying not to be like personally offended if I'm Neville that that name was chosen. I, would I, be I really think <laughs> what you just said, Andrew. I think is perfectly true that Harry kind of goes for maybe an incompetent wizard or maybe somebody that's like just a nobody. Nobody's going to care about kind of a name. Um, he needs an alias, but he doesn't say Ron Weasley, for instance. But since Neville's like, I'm pretty sure Neville's pure blood as is Ron and stuff, they could have known Neville. Uh, Stan would have, you know, might have known some of the other, you know, pure-blooded wizards. There aren't many of them um, in this world. So it's kind of a risk. Yeah, it would have been funny if uh, his grandmother was sitting a couple of seats over. <laughs> <laughs> Calls That's the boy, boy. over. <laughs> You've changed. You look different. Harry learns uh, quite a bit uh, about Sirius Black from Stan. Uh, and I thought this could be a good opportunity. I know we just did a name origin, Andrew, but another wow. one because it is relevant to what Harry just saw pages earlier, right? Sirius is the dog star, the brightest one in Canis Major, which is the great dog constellation, alluding to the fact that uh, Sirius can change into a big black dog. Uh, so this is... Uh, one of many names in the Harry Potter universe that uh, has uh, deeper meaning than just what's on the surface. I'm also thinking the brightest one, big eyes, maybe a little tie in there. Yeah. And the idea that he shines brightly uh, as being like the only one of the black family to be good uh, or to feel the call of good. We know Regulus um had some moments. <laughs> but for me, that really stands out as like Sirius Black said no to his family and became a Gryffindor when all the rest were Slytherin. It's kind of like like that level of bright. I always I always take to mean that even if they're not linked, I always take that to be like, oh yeah, I love Sirius, that. my boy. My, yeah, yeah, I like that too. Uh, and the first impression that we get of Sirius, and, and a lot of this is via Stan, is that he's a muggle-hating, friend-betraying, murderous psychopath who is Voldemort's right-hand man. (laughs) And uh, as we later learn, this couldn't be further from the truth. We get a little bit of insight into what happened that night uh, all those years ago. Uh, But I wanted to bring back something that Sherry touched on in our last episode. And it had to do with why Sirius really wasn't given a proper trial, right? This was the fan fiction that she had talked about writing you know, why didn't he have the ministry go ahead and investigate his wand? Why didn't he request that he be given Veretta serum to tell the truth? Like, there's so many questions here, and this speaks to the larger behavior of the ministry, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit. But it's almost like, again, that situation that we saw with Hagrid in Chamber of Secrets. Oh, we got our man. Yeah. And we're not going to even investigate. It's serious. He's the one responsible. There's not a whole lot of evidence other than the fact that he's there, but he could just be wrong place, wrong time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, whenever it comes to the question of why I wasn't serious, um, exonerated to begin with, you know, then they could have used like Verita serum too. I do blame Dumbledore mostly because that's, I don't know if Dumbledore just let Sirius there to rot because they had a falling out because he was not being a good operative or what, but, I think it's even said later that he provides evidence that Black was guilty, that he was the secret keeper for the Potters, all that stuff. But like, you mean to tell me they didn't have a single conversation, uh, you know, during that moment, man to man, where Sirius said, no, we changed. It was Peter. We got to look out for Peter. He's still out there. Because I think that would be actionable info that Dumbledore would really work on. Yeah. It is interesting, too, when you think about the fact that Hagrid mentions to Dumbledore in chapter one of Sorcerer's Stone that Sirius Black lent him his motorbike to bring Harry here. Mm, and Dumbledore's not like, right. wait, what? <laughs> because, <laughs> because obviously at this point, we are to presume Dumbledore believes that Sirius was still the Potter's secret keeper. I think for Sirius, though, it's just he's in a situation where he's lost his best friend. Yeah. And 
he probably feels like he's lost all hope. Presumably, Peter is also dead, right? That's what he believes. That's why he hasn't, you know, tried to do more up until this point. Still, it doesn't mean that the ministry shouldn't have done its job. No, right. They should have. There were also the witnesses who claimed that it was serious who did this. So he had that up against him, too. Yeah. And the maniacal laughing as he's being carried away is very in character for Sirius. He has an unhinged side. It's like if somebody just told him the funniest, dirtiest joke in the world, he's going to laugh at it all the way to Azkaban. Right. It's like that. He doesn't do it himself any favors um, because I, I think that like my reading of the whole blown up side of the street thing is that he knows he's been duped. He knows that Pettigrew has shown this amazing bit of magic, killed all these people and escaped. And Sirius is just like so shook uh, or surprised by Peter's skill and cleverness and duping everybody that he literally something in him breaks and he just laughs and probably lasts for like the next three days straight. Like that's always been my take on Sirius as far as like, yeah, and and you're right, Michael. Like he just suffered all that loss. Like I think that that's Sirius doesn't do himself any favors in getting put in jail to begin with. Right. Yeah, it's very much Peter, you son of a bleep. Like you know, yeah. and he's he's overcome with emotion, and it it's it's probably laughter that's coming from a different source than than actually feeling you know funny about the situation. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Also, there may be some confirmation bias going on with the ministry because, again, Sirius is a member of the Black family. They tend to overwhelmingly be affiliated with the dark side. So yeah. I think it would be very easy to turn Sirius into a scapegoat and say he was undercover the entire time acting yeah. as a friend to the Potters when actually he was... Uh, you know whose servant, his right hand man, which we know happened with another close friend of theirs. Yeah. Yep, they just got the wrong guy. And we're gonna get to talking about the ministry in just a minute here, but I did think it was important to call out, you know, when we were talking about this whole "we've got our man" mentality, um, that Fudge actually wasn't in power at the time that this all happened. So this speaks to a larger issue than just fudge, right? This is how mm. the ministry itself operates. So I know we like to crap on fudge a lot, but clearly, and Millicent Bagnold, who was minister before him, was actually very much liked, uh, at least according to wizardingworld.com. But clearly, uh, she did not do her her due diligence here when it comes to what happened that night in Godric's Hollow and beyond. That's yeah, a good reminder. So yeah, we will talk about Fudge in a moment, but we'll be right back after this quick break. So our next discussion here, what the Fudge? Uh, so Harry arrives at the Leaky Cauldron and he is greeted by none other than the Minister for Magic. And this is our first official introduction to Cornelius Fudge. We, of course, got a little bit of a taste of him in Chamber of Secrets, but as Harry notes, it's not like he could say, oh, yeah, actually, we've met before because he was hiding under the invisibility cloak in Hagrid's hut. So what are our initial impressions of the minister? How we feel about this guy? Uh, you're, don't take this the wrong way, but I'm going to say fatherly because yeah. he grabs Harry by the shoulder and kind of doesn't let him go and kind of guides him around. I that gave me flashbacks to like my dad doing the same thing when he wanted what? me under it, his thumb. <laughs> it's it's a fair point to make because Harry himself says that Fudge treats him like an uncle would a favorite nephew. <laughs> yeah, he keeps calling him my boy. He makes him tea, makes sure he's fed. Um, come on in. It's it, it's just so funny because you know that before Harry Potter turned up on the radar, uh, he was positively pulling his hair out freaking out that the ministry had, like lost their star boy. And I guess, again, first impressions, competent enough. Yeah. Like, sure, they got the serious issue going on, but he's fine for now. Mm. That's no. not my take. <laughs> I, I feel like this is someone who comes across as utterly and overly concerned with appearances. Not physical appearance, but the appearances of a circumstance and how it might reflect on him and his position. It's very clear that he's not 
relieved to see Harry because he has a deep care for Harry. He's relieved to see Harry because his ass isn't on the line now. You know, he knew that it was going to reflect badly on him if they lost Harry Potter. So. But you get all that from this first impression. I mean, in hindsight, yeah, a lot of this is abundantly clear. If you if you read kind of between the lines in their conversation where there's inconsistencies about, well, why did Harry get in trouble in Chamber of Secrets for not even doing magic? It was magic that somebody else did. But then here he's done something that is objectively more egregious than what happened in Chamber of Secrets. And Fudge yeah. is just so cavalierly like, we don't send people to Azkaban for blowing up their ants. Like, how often does that happen? It just feels very specific, very convenient. Fudge also notes uh, things like, you know, it's probably better if you don't go to Hogsmeade, given the current climate. Um, But he's not willing to clue Harry in about what exactly that climate is or how it impacts him. I think he learned that trick from Dumbledore. Yeah. And I know Harry has a strange feeling about the whole encounter, too. It's noted multiple times. Right. Well, he also confronts Fudge about, you know, actually, I did get an official warning because a house elf <laughs> you smashed a pudding. And then Fudge looks awkward. Like, he doesn't have an immediate answer to that because Fudge knows that these are special circumstances. But as you said, Laura is unwilling to divulge why they are special circumstances. Circumstances so says, change. <laughs> We just have to take <laughs> Yeah, I mean we're we're kind of touching on a lot of these different points here, but just to go back to the uncle nephew comparison for a second, is are are we meant to think of Vernon in this situation? Like it's interesting that that's the comparison that's mentioned, is that it's an uncle nephew. And is it a good thing? Like, you know, I know Harry says how an uncle treats a favorite nephew, but I don't know. All of our experiences with uncles in this series have not been good ones so far. Oh, that's a fit. That's a that's actually a fair point. Yeah, what right. Does it say? And so Harry, that's what registers with him in a way. That's kind of foreshadowing too. Right. I was gonna say, what frame of reference does Harry have for this circumstance? An uncle looking at his favorite nephew. He's never experienced that. Oh. <laughs> right. Oh. Right. Well. Laura, you were talking about this. Harry is very suspicious of why he is not in trouble, and rightly so. You know, he does reference the Dobby incident from Chamber of Secrets, to which Fudge responds that, quote, circumstances change. And I feel like this tells us all we need to know about how Fudge operates. And we come to see that, as you also talked about, in Order of the Phoenix. Like, it is a complete... I wouldn't even say it's a 180. Like, (laughs) there's a lot of flips that go on here. And, you know, Harry goes from being, uh, you know, in the good graces of the ministry and and Fudge's most important person to protect to to the one that they want to persecute. So, again, what is best for the optics, as somebody mentioned earlier, is really all that Fudge cares about at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, I think this still works to the to protect the mystery, though, of why he is being let off the hook here. It's obviously a pretty big book mystery that Sirius is after him specifically and why. So I like that we're shown this man who like is an incompetent government agent, but his not telling Harry these things is preserving the mystery for later. Right. But he's not even after Harry like that. That's. Yeah, the funny part is. of all of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they have to they have to create a situation where because if they were to arrest Harry or send Harry to Azkaban, well, who can get into Azkaban? Sirius Black can probably get into Azkaban if he can get out of Azkaban and Harry right. would be dead. But my point is he's not after Harry. He's after Pettigrew. Right. So it's right. like the, the ministry is is off base on even that part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Fudge personally is trying to fix his own mistake, I think. Is what Black has been overheard. He's at Hogwarts. He's at Hogwarts. And Fudge was like the last person to like have a meaningful interaction with him. So I think that Fudge is willing to believe the first thing that comes to his mind. Oh, he must mean Harry Potter. So he's quick to jump on any protection. 
that he does. But this line, circumstances change, Harry, is kind of like in the previous book with Lockhart, like books can be misleading. <laughs> He's like, you wrote them. It's like, you're literally making the circumstances change that I'm no longer going to get expelled right now. Right. And really, the, the chapter wraps itself up with it being clear that there's important information that Fudge is not willingly offering up to Harry. We see it throughout their conversation. He wants him to stay away from Muggle London. He asks that he come back to the Leaky Cauldron by nightfall. And he wouldn't sign Harry's Hogsmeade permission slip, which I oh. think is probably the biggest tell of all. Because yeah. as Harry says, dude, you're the minister. Like, your signature supersedes anybody else's. And yeah, maybe next year. Yeah, maybe next you year know. you can go. It's not that special. And then he says, rules are rules. <laughs> but it is also surprising that he trusts Harry to follow these orders because he does tell him. You know, stay at the Leaky Cauldron. Surely this directive coming from the Minister for Magic is influential. But can you really trust Harry or any child? Especially if you look at Harry's activities so far. (laughs) Maybe he doesn't know too much about what Harry's gotten up to at Hogwarts. Um, But I wouldn't trust Harry to obey what I'm telling him to do right now. I mean, clearly he doesn't because he says Tom's going to (laughs) be keeping an eye on you and reporting back to me. Oh, does he say that? Okay, I missed that, I guess. Yeah. Then never mind. Tom was great in this chapter, by the way. Yeah. Unsung hero, definitely up for MVP for if somebody wants to give it to him, because he takes care of Harry. Yeah, he does. But what's interesting about this, though, is as we do wrap up this chapter, is that it does lead to really what we could probably argue is one of the best stretches of time for Harry in the wizarding world. Uh, is is these next couple of days that he does get to spend uh, in Diagon Alley and the Leaky Cauldron. Free to be a wizard. Hey, he's free. Within boundaries. I mean, this is what his summers could have been like. Thank you, Dumbledore. Free of the Dursleys before having to uh, deal with school and all the work that comes with that. Yeah, it is worth also mentioning when Fudge is talking with Harry, he says that, you know, they got an agreement that Harry can go back to the Dursleys uh, at the end of term if he stays at Hogwarts for Christmas and Easter, to which Harry responds, I always stay at Hogwarts for Christmas and Easter, (laughs) and I don't want to go back. Uh, And Fudge is like, oh, well, you know, you might change your mind. (laughs) He wasn't picking up on what Harry was putting down. Anyway, (laughs) odds and ends from this chapter, wanted to bring up Madam Marsh. I, she clearly loves putting herself through it. Uh, despite her motion sickness, <laughs> she seems to be a frequent rider of the night bus. Uh, we will also see her again in Order of the Phoenix uh, when the Weasleys and Harry uh, board the night bus. Uh, she needs to get off before they get on because she uh, needs to get rid of uh, whatever she ate most recently. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk about Stan Shunpike here for a moment. Um, he does have some interesting developments that come later on in the series that I had forgotten about. Um, he ends up being mistakenly arrested by the ministry for being a suspected death eater in Half-Blood Prince because he was um, in, a, I think, a bar or restaurant uh, kind of bragging openly about how he was in on the death eaters plans. It, Turns out that he was just talking a big game and he had no idea what he was talking about and clearly was not somebody who would have been uh, trusted to be in the inner circles of Death Eaters. Um, He later breaks out of Azkaban and ends up joining the Death Eaters under the influence of the Imperious Curse. And he is among Mm. the attackers during the events of the Seven Potters in Deathly Hallows. I had completely forgotten about this until I did a little bit of a reread for Stan. It's a bum deal. It is. Wrong wrong place. Wrong. Like there's a little bit where, okay, Stan isn't intelligent enough to stay away from kind of danger, but nobody deserves to have that kind of trajectory. Mm-hmm. Um, presumably if it, you know, if he's all under the Imperious Curse during the later books, it's real sad. And this doesn't really relate to the chapter, but I just wanted to call out that early on in the pandemic, I was like, I should start building Legos. And I went to Target and I decided that my first Lego set would be the Night Bus. 
it just birthed a love of building Legos for me. And uh, I don't have it with me right now, but um, I'm seeing now that it's a retired product. So I have a collectible Lego product. Oh, I didn't wow. know that was retired. I have that one too. I don't know if I have my box saved. Did you save your box? <laughs> I do have my box. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, Laura's is worth slightly more. I'll shout out the um, amazing night bus uh, wall art that I got from Mike and Andrew when they went down into the uh, Wizarding World theme park. Yeah, I have I have it displayed uh, a few feet in front of me. I'm looking at it right now. Very nice. Because that's the, the cover of the illustrated POA. Jim K. I, uh, or I think it's either Kazu Kibuishi or it's um, one of the or it might have be it might have been an illustration from. Yeah, like you said, the illustrated POA. I forget what year it's from, but uh, it's really good art. I'm looking at awesome. It is the cover of Prisoner of Azkaban Illustrated. Oh, well, there you go. Night bus is on it. So I so Jim K. One. So the Jim K. Yeah. art. It's got Harry standing outside the bus. Yep. He's illuminated in the headlights. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. It's time for MVP of the week. I'm going to give it to the night bus, actually, for being a fast and safe method of travel for wizards who need to get around muggle communities. It's important to have mode of transportations like this for accessibility and just connecting cities. Plus, they have chocolate on board. Well, Micah, per your suggestion, I am going to give it to Tom, the barkeep. Book version, not movie version, leads Harry to his room. He says, if there's anything you need, Mr. Potter, please let me know. Nice guy. Nice guy. I'm going to give mine to Sirius because Sirius is the reason that Harry catches the night bus. And I'm going to give it to Hedwig, who makes an appearance at the very end of the chapter. Just brings Harry, uh, you know, down a few notches, makes him feel comfortable uh, after everything that's happened. So the fact that she knew where to go and she, and she showed up just at the right moment. So that's my MVP. Well, that is chapter three of Prisoner of Azkaban. If you have any feedback about today's episode, send an owl along to mugglecast at gmail.com or you can use the contact form on mugglecast.com. You can also send a voice message. Just record it using the voice memo app on your phone and then email us that file. Or you can use our phone number, which is 19203Muggle. That's 19203684453. Now it's time for our weekly Harry Potter trivia game, Quizage! Last week's question. Thank you, Micah. What name does Harry give to Stan Shunpike when he boards the night bus? And the correct answer, as we discussed, was Neville Longbottom. So last week's winners, and I tried to pick people we don't usually read the names of, so here you go. Last week's winners were actually a herbologist, R.E. Ash, uh, Callie Loves Quizich, Chicken and Quaffles, Daniel O. Dutch Hufflepuff, Fastest Thing Alive, Forrest, the 10-year-old, Foxy Witch, Harry Styles, Hufflepuff Doll, Hufflepuff Plant Lady, Justice for Tom the Barkeep, amen that, Marge's Evil Bulldog, Quoth the Ravenclaw, the Gnome in the Weasley's Christmas Tree, the Loose Floorboard, and the Old Lady at 12 o'clock. Next week's Quizzage question is... In Chapter 4 of Prisoner of Azkaban, a hag walks into the Leaky Cauldron and orders what... Submit your answer to us on the Quizich form on the MuggleCast.com website, MuggleCast.com slash Quizich, or go to MuggleCast.com and click on Quizich in the main nav. Make sure you're following MuggleCast for free in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. And hey, tell a friend about the show. Also, leave us a five-star review if your podcast app allows you to and you're enjoying the show. And last but not least, don't forget to follow us on social media. We're MuggleCast on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok while it still exists in America. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this week's episode. I'm actually Andrew. I'm not Neville. I am only Seamus on Wednesdays. And otherwise, I'm, I'm Eric all the time. I'm not really Stan. I'm Micah. And not really Luna. I'm mostly Laura. <laughs> <laughs> mostly, Bye, everybody. mostly Laura. Mostly. <laughs> How can you be mostly Laura? Bye. Bye, y'all.